And so they may end up, for example, just the worst possible case, uh, as long as the big bubble stock is in China, where people are willing to work at 70 cents an hour or 7 cents an hour, maybe, that the only job that the United States can fund will be jobs that, are, that can't be uh, not tradable jobs. All right, let me, let me rephrase it. Yeah. Cleaning, help. Yeah, but let me, let me rephrase it. Okay. We've got 180 currency monopolists around the world, different countries, however many there are. Anybody know how many countries there are right now? The currencies? 200. 200, okay, 200. We have 200 currency monopolists around the world. Does that, does that include the Buckaroo? Yeah, oh, Buckaroo, 201. Now, let's look at, you know, with the Buckaroo, the government, the school does not restrict supply and there's no unemployment. And just like with the Buckaroo, because anybody can go to work and earn a Buckaroo anytime they want. And there's not only no inflation, it's been the strongest currency in the world. Buckaroo has gone from $10 a piece five years ago to $20 a piece now. Outperformed the stock market, outperformed everything else. <laughs> And, and, uh, and with zero interest rate policy. So it's, it's been. <laughs> we, we were in we, one of these post anti things. We were in Hungary when it was still communist. And the kid, we fight, they never had unemployment. And when we talked to the people in the Communist Party, they said, well, we pretend to pay them and they pretend to work. Right. The fact was, you could get the fun, there was no products uh, in the market. Yeah. That they, yeah, that's starting to happen. Yeah, so which is another problem it's having today. We can get full employment, but it's all going to get exported to the Middle East anyway. The way they they're demanding, it. they're changing the real terms of trade on us, and there's nothing we can do about it. So it's almost an exercise in futility. But apart from that, we got 201 currency monopolists, and each one of them imposes a tax. And each one of them, if there is any <coughs> unemployment, it's because in any one of those currencies, unemployment is currency specific. It's somebody looking for paid work in a specific currency. Any one of those is creating that, is allowing that unemployment because they're not spending enough to cover the tax bill and the net savings desire in their own currency. Now, we know also as a point of, uh, as a beginning point, that, that the cause of unemployment is taxation. The point of taxation is unemployment. We're trying to move resources from the private sector to the public sector. That's what governments mandated to do. And the way we do it is we impose a tax. And now all these people who were previously doing whatever they were doing, if you start with a non-monetary society like the British did in Africa, when they wanted to get people to move to the coffee plantations, they imposed a hut tax on everybody. And now all these people who are doing whatever they were doing are unemployed in the sense that they need British pounds to pay the tax or they get their hut burned down. Okay, now that, what do we have to do to get it? Okay, they go to work, you can work in a coffee plantation for one a day. And so the tax creates the unemployment, and then the spending gives the me is the means to use. So when we create the unemployment, we've th at that point moved everybody out of the private sector into the public domain. When you're unemployed, you're in the public sector. You wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the public sector tax. The unemployment is defined that you're looking for that paid work, not that there aren't things to do in the world, but that you're looking for that specific paid work. So the tax has moved you out. Now you're in the public. Now what's the public sector going to do with you? Well. For most of you, it's going to give you a job. You're going to be in the Army, you're going to be building aircraft carriers, you're going to be doing all kinds of stuff. And then, but for some of you, it says, okay, that's it, closed, 5% stay unemployed, that's our buffer stock against inflation. Right. Those are a creation of the tax and a spending insufficient to pay the tax and that save for the further purpose of establishing price stability. Fine, and they've got all these mathematical equations which say if you don't and you allow price stability, you've got problems. You got runaway inflation. So what we're saying is that we have an option now, and we understand how the currency works, that the um, this buffer stock can be an employed buffer stock rather than an unemployed buffer stock. Okay, and then the people you've moved out of the private sector into the public sector, you you're using them all. The private sector still has its people. If it doesn't have enough, you can cut your taxes and then you won't get so many people to, out of the private sector. If you cut your taxes to zero, they'll all be in the private sector. Nobody will use the currency or work in the public sector. Okay. All right, enough. Am I done, Rick? <laughs> Go ahead, yes. Uh, Paul and I have been having a correspondence with South Africa and Africa and the developing countries generally. South Africa has, in a way, a kind of employer last resort in the sense that half of its positions in the government sector are unfilled. Now, they're only hiring black guys and black women. But the 
trouble is the skills are so low. And um, if I speak to any economist in Stavros, they say all that employment is structural. That is, there aren't skills out there to do any of these things that are demanded. And there are minimum wage laws. So basically, if you like to say that, that uh, the rate you've got to pay unskilled workers in the former sector is just too high, so they're not, they're not, they're not going to get hired. Now, um, you know, I can remember as a little, yeah. Your, I, what's missing in your whole story, I think, and it sounds like reactionary sort of classical argument, is scarcity of skills. I mean, if it's true yeah. that but that's a little kind of, yeah, right, right, right. Look, I, 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 look I, when I was a little kid, I was hearing my parents talking about it. I'm reading a paper about lack of skills. There. There's always a lack of skills. There's never not, you can't, by definition, there's always a lack of skills. Always, yeah. always. What, I mean, all the economists and so that, even the other level guys, say this unemployment is structural. And what they mean is, if the government spends more, yeah. it's going to be primarily inflation. I, I know, I know. Now, what do you do about it? You offer a job to anybody willing, able to work at a non-disruptive wage, and then there's a lot to do. For example, if I uh, offered funding to everybody in this room for personal, to everybody in the United States, everybody in this room, for personal assistance, who would not go out and take me up on that? Everybody would, right? Because nobody can even keep their photographs straight on, right. on their computer anymore, right? You, you, everybody needs help. <coughs> more cost to manage them and uh, the value they can add. Yeah, so you, you would need not only three or four personal assistants, but a manager for your personal assistants, okay? And they, and they all need their own personal assistants. So how many would actually get hired? And the answer is zero, because everybody would want one. And nobody, there wouldn't be anybody left to be a personal assistant. There's an infinite amount of stuff to do. The question is funding. And, and, and the way the monetary system allocates who has to be the personal assistant, who gets the personal assistant, who has to dig the gold, and who gets to take it to London and buy a new suit, which we talked about before. So there's, there's always infinite things to do. And even in Africa, before it was monetized, it wasn't like everybody sitting around with nothing to do. Everybody was busy, occupied, doing things. Well, that's the informal sense. Well, the yeah, it's informal. But if we're going to, the way you monetize this, Okay, if, again, if you offer everybody a job and give them things to do that you might have previously considered informal jobs, that's fine, but there's all kinds of childcare, just people holding hands in the nursing home, there's like infrastructure repair, maintenance, there's all kinds of, there's like infinite amount of things to do. Teaching assistants, help in the police department, uh, night watchmen in the neighborhoods, all these things that if you offered funding for all this stuff, there's this huge demand just for services. Look, how many people in the, it, I think it was a less than 10% or maybe it's certainly less than 20%. Less than 1% grows all the food, right? Another 10 or 15% does all the manufacturing. What do the rest of us do? Other than digging holes and filling them in. Oh yeah, very important legal paperwork and tax work and all this stuff. I mean, yeah, we're doing some stuff. I, I don't disagree. But it's all up for grabs, right? The, so, anyway. But the point is, once you understand that it's not a... You can't even begin to tell South Africa or discuss offering everybody a job who wants a job and then having them do basic uh, infrastructure work or whatever, unless you understand there is no solvency issue. Because there's an implied solvency issue, this is not discussed. Is this even discussed anywhere? No. When you go to India, why is it a limited program? Where's the money going to come from? Why did they drop it in Argentina? Because uh, somebody spent that money there instead. There isn't any that money there with this. You know, so once it, it takes getting past the basic accounting of how the monetary system works before these ideas even get discussed. Well, they're willing to pay for transfers. Like an old age program, everybody huddles around their grandmother because she gets an old age job. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs>